Welcome, welcome, and good morning to the Rick Helps Real Estate Show. We're trying to make sense of this crazy Arizona real estate market. I hope everybody had a great weekend. It's getting a little toasty out there. Here it comes, although I think we're supposed to get a little relief this week, but 97 and 98 is just a little too close to 100 for me. And uh, But it is May 1st, so I guess we should expect that, huh? So what is going on in the real estate market here in Arizona? It's been an interesting one to watch. While we thought that the rates were just absolutely going to kill sales, we're seeing a little uptick here in spring. Um, not huge, but, you know, you're following the numbers here, and you can see that we're up to about 3,500, 3,600 contracts when we were down around 3,100 every seven days. But, you know, the... The dilemma continues. Here we are with our listings going down yet again. Now, the listing numbers that they show on Cromford are slightly different than what, what I'm presenting, um, just that I pull mine right off the MLS. And um, I'm not, and I know they do as well. I'm just not sure how they track it. So I'm showing about 12,000, what is it, 12,300 this morning. And they're showing as of Saturday night, 11,595. But regardless, you can see that we're below the 20, 20 numbers right here. So it's going down, not up. And sales <clears throat> are active enough. I don't want to use the word brisk. Sales are active enough to where we're starting to see some confidence build out there with sellers. And you can see that here with uh, the list pricing is going up. You can see that it was pretty much flatlining here, right? Now it's going up. And so um, I don't think that's anything everybody really wants to see. We've been kind of sitting back hoping that we'd get a little glimmer of affordability, but we're sitting here creeping back up to the prices we saw, the asking prices at the peak in 2022. And, uh, you know, we were all kind of hoping we'd end up down here, weren't we? Uh, at least somewhere close to that. And for a while there, it looked like maybe that was going to happen as we saw things dip in this little period here. We thought, okay, here it goes. Not that I wish lower prices for everybody to lose equity, but uh, it would be kind of nice to have a little bit of an adjustment um, for affordability for people. If you are listing your home, I mean, the, there isn't any more clear indicator that this is a decent time to list your home. It's uh, they're moving. And uh, for buyers, um, you know, couple, <coughs> excuse me, a couple months ago, you had time to go home and talk about it, think about it, and uh, decide if you're going to list your house. And now that window is shrinking. It's not like you need to make a decision while you're in the driveway. But, uh, you know, sometimes if you go home and you sleep on it, you might not get to sleep in it. So, you know, make sure you're you're comfortable with your decisions. But uh, the, the window of thinking is narrowing as we get there. And the other interesting thing I'm seeing here too, now this is going to lag, I believe. And that is that percent of closings with seller paid concessions. This is going to lag because these are numbers here showing in April that we've dipped to 45% from a peak of 51%. That's not significant, but those were contracts that were probably written in March. Um, so as we see asking prices coming up and as we see, uh, contracts increasing, I expect this number to start coming down. We're still seeing average concessions of around $9,000. Um, I expect that to come down as well, too. So as you're looking at listing your home, you know, we were encouraging people when things were really tight in November, December, and early January to consider contributing to help people buy down their interest rate. Um, it's looking less likely that you'll have to pony up with that. Uh, we've got uh, Mr. Smack here says, I work for a new home builder in Santan Valley. We had a grand opening April 1st, sold out all of our inventory, roughly 23 homes, average price 350 to 380. Well, that's going to shock that guy from Texas that uh, came in and said that we were going to have a glut of new construction. And I got some numbers to share with that as well. Do you see the prices in home renovations going down at all? Labor's real tight still. Um, labor and materials are tight, so I don't think so anytime soon. Um, here's what we're seeing here on the Cromford report. Now, it's going to be hard for you to see it, so I'm just going to read it to you. The U.S. Census Bureau has provided us with new building permit counts for March 
2023, we could see some recovery in single family building plans. For Maricopa and Pinal County's developers scaled back their planning for new homes starting in July of 2022 and reached the low of just 997 in December. January and February were a little better, but March has seen a jump back to 2,216. This is well below the 3,000 levels we were seeing regularly in 2021 and 2022, but it suggests the trend has reversed. Home builders are clearly feeling in an optimistic mood, which is not surprising. Now, in the multifamily segment, expansive building plans are still accelerating. There were 3,143 housing units granted permission in March across Maricopa and Pinal. This is the highest monthly total ever seen and includes 2,046 in Phoenix, city's highest ever. A lot of multifamily housing units showing up, and that is going to give you some rent relief. Uh, the occupancy rates are still low. Good morning, Stephanie. And uh, good morning to you, Jackie. Uh, we'd love let that guy know. <laughs> you want to call that guy. I, we're all talking about the guy that was standing at four o'clock in the afternoon in a new development going, look, there's nobody here and all these houses are here and they're going to crash and we're going to have this glut of inventory. It's not happening, is it? I mean, I'm happy for him. He's got an active channel. Everything's fabulous. I hope he's killing it, making lots of money on YouTube. But I don't see it happening. Could it? Yeah, there's a lot of dark clouds floating around there. I'm going to touch on that in just a little bit, but uh, nothing too too alarming in the short term here. We can see that our mortgage rates are just hovering this week, and they're going to hover. They're going to hover until May 10th. Um, so, and even, even uh, Mr. Smack here says that he's got, uh, uh, let's see, it showed up here. Here we are. Uh, I have buyers ready to buy as soon as we release more lots too. So they're lining up there. Did you hear about uh, what's that called? A plea, Jackie, I don't know, being called a new build community in Texas. Oh, the police. Oh, okay. One more down. Yeah, he was in a new build community, this guy. And we're, we're, we're picking on him for a reason here, folks. He, uh, um, he was in there and he was in the community and he was filming and he wasn't saying great things about it. And they called the cops on him. <laughs> <laughs> that's too bad but rates right now we're sitting here at 6.59 on a national scale and a national average uh, your lender will probably beat that it all depends on your debt to income ratio credit score etc so this is just an average um, and so we're seeing that it's just going to kind of muddle in this zone for a little bit and that's until uh, we see some action by by the federal reserve now those numbers are already in. There's a 93% in the in the Fed surveys, 93% of traders are um, convinced that the central bank is going to go up another 25 basis points. So that is all built into the mortgage rates. And if you've seen on here that every time we look and we track what they do, the day that they announce um, a rate hike, even if it's only like 0.25, uh, mortgage rates go down. And that's because, oh, well, we knew they were going to do that. So, okay, great. Now, if they exceed 0.25, which I just can't see them doing it. I mean, the banking situation that we have is just absolutely brutal out there. I mean, look what's going on this morning. Over the weekend, the FDIC was uh, putting this bank up for auction, and uh, they had to get their bids in by last night. And J.P. Morgan seized it. First Republic Bank is seized, sold to J.P. Morgan in largest U.S. bank failure. Oh, man. Uh, let's hope this doesn't continue, but it looks like it is. Good morning, Keenan. Good to see you. Um, so this is kind of what's making us nervous out there, folks, and that is these bank failures. And how big is it going to get? What's it mean? There's some articles out there where the Federal Reserve says, well, there's nothing to worry about here. But traders don't trust them right now. And they're going, well, you're telling us that, but, you know, I'm not sure I believe you. And so it's just another number to watch. Uh, commercial real estate's getting kind of sticky, but that's not going to raise its ugly head anytime soon. They're projecting maybe a year, two years out. Uh, there'll be some tightening, some foreclosures in commercial lending uh, may or may not roll into residential. Uh, it's hard to see uh, too many situations where foreclosures start increasing in residential because even, I mean, if you walk through the scenario and go, well, 
I've lost my job. I have to sell my house. Well, you can sell your house. Um, you're probably not going to have it foreclosed on because you've got enough equity to cover your selling costs. Here's what we're seeing here. Now, this one's important. As we're looking at inflation data and the Fed looks at rent and housing costs as about 33% of the CPI number. And they also look at, uh, uh, what's the other one? It's called uh, PCE, uh, where they don't include housing. But we're seeing here, this is the year over year percent change in rent. And you can see that it's all going down. So they're, they got a gray line here that says recession. So owner's equivalent of rent residents, which is the red line. Well, that's that's kind of a silly one in that it says, it's just a survey that says, you know, hey, Rick, if you were to rent your house, how much do you think you'd get for it? I don't know, 2,200, 2,500. Thank you. Hey, Bob, if you were to rent your house, and that's what that number is. That's why that's going up, right? Everybody's thinking, well, you know, I saw a case Schiller index uh, coming out in January, and uh, I think I can get more rent. But the true numbers of the core logic and Zillow observed and the actual rent of primary residents and actual rent of apartments national are all going the other direction. Now, the dark blue line here, which is, uh, uh, let's see, which one is that? The, they're really hard to tell the difference here. But the this one is the red line that I see here is people saying what they think their homes rent for and then the other line is reality. Now, it's almost getting to the point to where it's heading towards zero, and this will help us. This will help inflation tremendously, and it'll make the Fed back off. This is the big number that they're following, so everybody's looking at that. Um, I've been asked if I can estimate how many current buyers are local and out of the area versus California. 90% of his buyers are in California. I'm not seeing that high of a number. I'm really not. Um, I don't think it has spiked. I think it's actually come down a little bit versus 2021 20, and 22. Um, I don't have a number to look at there. Um, sometimes the Cromford market uh, tracks it, but uh, it's not something I've been been tracking. It's, uh, um, But I'm not seeing in my small little world that, that they're all coming over from California. In fact, of the few transactions that we've had past couple of months, they've all been local people and uh, first-time home buyers. So uh, that surprises a lot of people. Uh, Stephanie here saying, getting gutting of Dodd-Frank by Congress and Trump hasn't helped the improvement of fractional reserve banking. Um, yeah, that There's parts of that I'd like to see him dump, Stephanie, and parts of it that uh, I understand, but I'm not sure. I don't know banking enough to really weigh in on that. There are some of the Dodd-Frank things, like I don't like the uh, FHFA, or not the FHFA, the uh, CFPB. Um, that's the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. For me as a real estate agent, a lot of people don't know this, but they're self-funded. Congress doesn't fund them. And there's a bill out now trying to can that agency. Trump canned it as soon as he came in. Biden came in and put it back on. It's got some protections in there. I get it. I understand it. But in my industry... Check this out. If I let's do something simple. Um, title agencies, if they're going to make flyers for me, postcards, I have to pay 50% of it. They have to pay 50% to show that nobody's giving me anything. And there were title companies out there that were just printing flyers for free for agents and they were starting to get in trouble. Well, the, this agency can come in and they can fine me. Are you sitting down? $10,000. Now, let's say that I can actually show that I paid my 50% and I want to dispute this. There was no opportunities for arbitration or mediation. This is your fine. Live with it, Rick. You have no recourse. They're self-funding. They want the 10 grand. They only had two offices in the country. One was in Washington, D.C., and one was here in Phoenix. So we were all just shaking in our boots, and we were not about to cross the line. But what was irritating was... They're self-funding, so they, the more fines that they put out there, the more money they get coming in, and we had no recourse. So I don't mind people overseeing things, but give us an opportunity to dispute it if we think it's wrong. Now, Jackie's saying she's seen a lot of Utah people here showing up for some reason. Um, Trade-wise, uh, great question. Because I recall on an earlier article that more than 70% of local residents were priced out of the market. 
you know, we're seeing that. Um, it'd be nice to see some affordability, but every time we look at this affordability and go, well, we hit the ceiling, um, it's still active. And I look at affordability and go, how can people afford to live in San Francisco with those prices? And yet they do. Um, Smack here saying most of my buyers have been working with have been first time home buyers local. Yes, that's what I'm seeing, um, especially in new builds because they can get those low interest rates. And our homes with pools selling faster and getting sales price without them. Here's the deal with pools. If you don't have a pool and you got to put one in, you're going to pay at least $60,000. You're going to wait forever. So there is some value if you're looking for a pool to get a home that's already got one. Um, I haven't found that as a rule that they're selling faster with the pool versus not having a pool because it all depends on the personal preference of the buyers that you have out there. If they want a pool, that's a big deal. But there's a lot of people just don't want to deal with a swimming pool. So putting in a $60,000 swimming pool will not make your home $60,000 higher in value. That has been proven over and over again. And it's, uh, um, um, it's debatable how many people are actually looking at homes or pools versus, uh, you know, not having one. So that was kind of, I drove around the building a couple times on that question, didn't I? <laughs> so, and Jackie here is saying, plus an appraisal on appraisals at 70,000 pool might only get $16,000 credit on the appraisal. So they are not the, uh, the winning solution. I just was at a friend's uh, birthday party for their, uh, uh, three-year-old son this weekend and they did a tremendous job remodeling their house and i say well your kitchen looks great and this night he goes yeah we finally got our double oven uh, it took 10 months so it's there's still a lag in getting materials and i have been told uh, at one point and i think it was last year that you know they're digging the pits for these pools and they're putting in the rebar and then they're waiting for the gunite which is the cement that they spray them for the pool. And they're just sitting there and you've got this big mud pit in your backyard and you're waiting for it, or you're waiting for the plumbing materials. That, that part has improved, but there's nothing quick about getting a pool built these days. That's for sure. And it's, uh, um, it's not something I'd want to go through again. I got one when I first moved here, gosh, my pool was done in, uh, I think it was two weeks. Um, and I remember it was a new development. Some of the neighbors were really mad because, Mine started right away, and there were other people that were waiting for their pools to be built. And so when they went to them and said, how come Rick's is getting started right away? Well, I was on a corner lot, and they had really easy access. So when they wanted to knock down the block wall to get in, mine was easier to get into. So they said, well, let's start there. So everybody could see the progress and see what they were doing, and they were a little ticked. <laughs> but, hey, I got my pool. I was done. Je uh, Stephanie says, what's the monthly yearly expense of owning a pool? Um, that depends. And, uh, Jackie saying, yeah, it took 16 months for a pool to put in finished about a year ago. Um, the monthly expense, if you're getting a pool guys, about 75 to a hundred dollars a month from what I understand, I haven't hired a pool guy in a long time. I always did my own chemicals. It was just part of my Saturday morning routine to go out, and check the levels, and make sure the pH and chlorine levels, right. Brush it out, clean, you know, backwash the filter. It's just, what I did rather than waiting for somebody to come in. Cause for me, when you got a pool guy, it's great. They come by every Tuesday, but then you got a dust storm on Wednesday. You can't just wait until Tuesday to clean the pool. And if you call him to come over and clean it up after a dust storm, he's probably not going to get there for a couple days and you don't want to leave all that stuff floating around your pool. So chemicals have gone way up. Uh, chlorine has gotten it really expensive. And uh, Keenan here is saying, uh, it is too much money, <laughs> but it's nice having one. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's nice to have one. Um, it's uh, when it's really hot. I mean, you start get home work. I go straight to the bedroom, put on the swimming pool, swimming suit, get into the pool. And uh, Keenan here, just a bummer. Chemicals have gone up so much since COVID. It's crazy. Um, being asked, how are rents in Gilbert? Gilbert looking for September. They're kind of flat right now, down just slightly, but just get in the car and drive around Gilbert. And you can see how many new complexes are coming up. So the new uh, new ones that are being constructed are going to have lower rents than the existing one. But they're, you know, they're still up there. Um, you know, when you look and see that rental prices have gone down, you know, five cents a square foot, um, 
that that doesn't help my checking account any. Uh, I'll never have a pool again, said Tyler. The cost and commitment's way higher than the benefits of use, unless maybe you have small kids that use it all the time. Um, you know, I find that people get here when they first move here, they're swimming in March, you know, because they're it's it's 80 degrees and the pool's 65, 68. And, oh, this is great. We're going to swim in this pool all the time. And then as you get more acclimated, uh, you're not jumping in until the end of May. And you're not using your pool as much as you thought you would. And then people buy pools that have heaters. And after they get the, the first bill from their gas company after heating it, they don't do that again. So they uh, tend to use them far less than they think. But when you do use them in the summer, they are nice. But when you're sitting there in the winter and you're just looking out and, you're, you know, and it's, it's, you know, 40 degrees outside, 50 degrees, you're not swimming in the pool. Um, you're just, all you're doing is maintaining it. And you still have to maintain all the chlorine levels and everything uh, in the wintertime. So it can be a, uh, it can be a lot of work. So that's your pool question right there. If you like working on it, um, you know. Um, so Jackie says, we have a pool, have a heater. I have a stroke when Jordan begs to heat it. Yeah, when you have that birthday party scheduled and everybody's coming over and their birthday parties in, uh, let's say, March. Okay, we'll heat the pool. That gas bill can be 300 bucks. <laughs> it takes a few days for it to heat up. And then... Uh, uh, away you go. You go, hey, that party was fun. Oh, crap, here's the bill. <laughs> now, I don't see a lot of numbers coming out this week. Um, there's, uh, We're actually going to start a new series on here uh, on this channel. I talked to uh, Pat at Price Mortgage yesterday, and I convinced him, um, and I'm very happy that he is excited to do it, to come out with a show on Monday night's that are calling, we're going to call the week ahead. In other words, he's going to show you where the rates are and he's going to show you what we're looking at this week. So let's say you got a contract and you're looking, do I lock, do I not lock? Uh, we're hoping that this will be insightful for you. So on Monday evenings, pack and come on and go, here's the movement we're seeing. We're going sideways, not a lot changing. Or, hey, we're expecting things to drop by Thursday. Here's why we say that. And he's just going to put this out there every week on Monday night. It's going to be simply called the week ahead, be about five, eight minutes long. And uh, so I think that's going to be uh, insightful for everybody. And it'll be on my channel versus having Pat start his own YouTube channel. Cause I was joking him. I said, you know, you're going to put out your first video. You're going to get 15 views and you're going to have to wait a year and a half for people to find you. So let's just do it on my channel and it's going to come out on Monday night. Now, next week, uh, I will be live on Monday morning, Tuesday morning. I might be, but I doubt it because uh, that's when I'm leaving on my trip. And uh, But I do have my Starlink satellite set up, and I'm learning how to uh, use that. Um, I actually posed a question in one of the forums yesterday and said, is there a proper shutdown uh, procedure for this? Because I kind of got freaked out. Somebody said, yeah, if you don't shut down your satellite properly, uh, your your modem or something gets all screwed up. So, I mean, I just turned it off and unplugged it. Evidently, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to use your phone app and then click the button that says store. Then the satellite literally flattens out. So I'm learning. I'll try not to screw it up while I'm on the trip. I've been invited to a uh, this realtor who's out on the East Coast has a very vibrant um YouTube channel. It's called Saks Realty out of uh, Maryland. And I have been invited uh, to a national panel that I'm going to be on there. We're going re to record it at 4.30 on Tuesday. So I'm definitely going to need to figure out this satellite stuff before I jump on, jump on that one. So in the meantime, hopefully I'll see everybody here tomorrow morning. And this may replay tonight. What I do is I pull a live version down. I trim off the intro and then put it back up as an upload for everybody to see. And I thank everybody for watching. Have a great day. Take on the rest of the week. Take care.